Good afternoon and welcome to our Family Voice Zoom session this afternoon. My name's Andrew McColl. I'm the Queensland Director for Family Voice. And it's my pleasure to welcome to our Zoom session this afternoon, Amanda Cam. Amanda is the State Government Shadow Minister, or I should say State Government MP for the Sundays. Good afternoon, Amanda. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. So you've been in Parliament now about 10 years and you've seen some comings and goings in that time. Uh, you're, you're from the central coast of what I would call roughly central coast of Queensland. You're a married lady with three children, three grown children, I understand. I, I guess they think they're all grown children uh, or adults. So well, they, they, they are young adults, actually, Andrew. Yeah. So <laughs> I've only been in Parliament. This is my first term, actually. So four years. So, okay. Yeah, and I was formerly a uh, deputy mayor of Mackay Regional uh, Council area. So, yes. I've been, and I've run for the Senate for the LNP. So I've um, uh, probably yeah coming close to ten years in public life. Great. So just thinking about the election coming up in about ten weeks or so. Why do you think social conservatives should vote for the LNP? Well, um, what I certainly think is if you look at over the last 30 years of, in particular, Queensland politics, we've had 25 years of that under the Labor government. Yep. And I think when you look at the social issues confronting our community, um, and many of them have been in the media, we've we've seen, you know, um, catastrophic rates of youth crime. Uh, we've got the highest number of children in state care of any other state. Um, we have systems that are that are broken. We've got breakdown in community where we've seen prevalence of alcohol, other drugs, mental health, suicide. So in my time in parliament, I've sat on the mental health select committee um, of parliament. I've also sat on the um, uh, Economics and Governance Committee. And through that work and my three shadow portfolios of child protection, prevention of domestic family, sexual violence, and also women's economic security, on every social indicator, things have gotten worse, um, in particular in this in this last decade almost, um, where we have seen, um, you know, communities in crisis, uh, children as young as, you know, babies and uh, more recently, um, you know, five and six-year-olds um, being put into residential care. Um, we've seen uh, no adoptions or, or rarely any that have occurred over the course of Labor's time in power. And so when we point to, I think, the things that are important to social conservatives, um, it's pretty clear that the current government and the Labor government has failed in what are those um, policy areas and values that are connecting particularly our most vulnerable um, with the support and care that they need. Right. So just thinking about abortions, uh, I've, I've seen you before talking about what we do in Queensland and do you want to see abortions in Queensland reduced? Um, I... Absolutely think um, that there is um, a need and an opportunity there to see women have choice to be able to, one, either care for their child uh, or two, as well as the opportunity, um, as I mentioned before, whether it's adoption or long-term care orders. Um, I'm meeting with families all across the state, some who can't have children, and then I meet with families who have made the choice to care for those children who may not have parents that can care for them. And when they have come to the state government wanting permanency or have wanting to adopt children, um, that has not been seen favourably by the current government. And therefore, I have certainly met um, women across this state that feel like that they have had no other option. Um, and that is something where I think women haven't had uh, the full choice that they need or the support that they need um, to be able to make the decisions that are in the best interest for them or their unborn child. Okay, so would you therefore bring changes to the care of needy children in Queensland choosing adoption as your preferred model as opposed to the Labor Party's 
preferred model of foster care? Um, there's absolutely opportunities when we look at some of the figures of the number of children that have been in care. So there are cases where there are children that have been in care since they were newborn babies and they wow. are still in the care of foster carers now and they're in their teenage years um, where it has not been, uh, there has not been an opportunity or support for them to be adopted where they may like to be. I've also uh, had experience where there's been cases where some children have had up to 36 placements in residential care over the course of their life. Right. And I met a young man who was from the age of two through to 17 has had over 36 placements. And um, that, to me, has demonstrated that there has been a complete failure in the current system uh, where that young person absolutely, um, in, the, in the conversations that we had, would have welcomed the opportunity um, to have been permanently placed with a family. So I, uh, back in the time of the federal coalition, uh, and Michelle Landry actually was the assistant minister, my colleague, federal colleague for children and families, we had reviewed both the national figures as well as um, back then state by state. And Queensland was the worst performing state when it came to uh, adoption. So uh, yes, when I speak to families all across the state, I think there is absolutely opportunity um, to, to further enhance that. So when you say further enhance, you, you mean to go to... Improve the numbers of okay. children that have access to adoption and improve the numbers of families. So we have families at the moment that have to go internationally and it takes years and years um, for them to be able to adopt when we have children, uh, almost 2,000 now sitting um, in residential care and over uh, 12,000 almost sitting in the in the child safety system. So where they can't be reunified with family, where they don't can't be reunified with kinship carers, where there is um, clearly uh, real challenges and, and um, you know, there's a number of cases where you can see that there is real challenges, um, there is definitely opportunity uh, to, to look at adoption and look at the adoption model in how we can, we can enhance that both for the child but also for those families that choose to adopt. Sure. So should you hold your seat and the LNP wins office in October and you're given the family's portfolio, do you wish to change the Labor government's plan to decriminalise prostitution? Um, that bill has gone through the House. Um, we did vote um, uh, through that period um, against some of that legislation. I'm just trying to recall. It was only just recently, sorry, um, as in the details behind Um uh, our position, and I think the Attorney General, uh, Shadow Attorney General, sorry, Tim Nichols actually spoke to that bill at length as to what our concerns were, right. and it, there was definitely a statement of reservation. Um, as one individual, I don't get to make that decision, but I certainly um, think that um, there was a strong sense from many people in the community that there was elements in that bill that were very concerning around safety and um, and yep. community safety. Yeah. So and I and, and so therefore, I mean, that is a decision then of both party policy and of a of a future government as to whether that reform and some of the those things we highlighted are brought back um to be considered um through a parliamentary process. Okay. So would you be familiar with the the so-called Nordic model, which penalizes the buyers of sex, not the providers? And as you may be aware, the Nordic model is now used extensively in Europe where rates of prostitution have significantly reduced wherever it's been adopted. Yes, and the committee and members of our committee also, I believe, received a number of submissions around the Nordic model and did yes. make some comments on that. Um, it was certainly part of the briefing that we were provided by that committee. Um, obviously, the government made other decisions and other recommendations and have the numbers to pass that, but it certainly was something um, that I know many of us had reflected on um, to look at what those models um, do and some of those evaluations and what's worked over uh, in in those part in that part of the world. So um, it was certainly discussed, and I believed um, through that committee process, our members certainly had considered that as well. Right. So, what are your thoughts, Amanda, on the Cata Party's Babies Born Alive legislation, which would protect the lives of babies that that do survive an abortion? 
Yep. Um, so I know this led. I, I know that bill and proposal very well, um, actually, what? because George Christensen was the first person to really raise that, I believe, prior to the Cata Party um, in his time in office. And I know George as my former federal member. So um, as a uh, former, when he was formerly with the LNP, we, we were acutely aware of his advocacy for the Babies Born Alive legislation. Sure. And the Cata Party has obviously continued that. Um, that uh, as, That is a bill before the House that certainly <coughs> I can't comment on the party's position or, or our position, but personally, um, I can say from my own personal conscience that I, I do support the intent um, of that bill and um, and have and have spoken about that quite openly um, in the past, um, even prior to the CADA party bringing that. But I can't preempt exactly what the LNP's position would be. My understanding is is that um, I, I mean I can guess what it would be, but my understanding because many of us um, you know from uh, value life, and so it's pretty you know black and white in that regard. But uh, my understanding of that bill is it is unlikely to be uh, heard before this dissolution of this parliament. Um, and uh, so I'm not too sure what that means from a legislative perspective. But I had also spoken to uh, our former president, uh, sorry, our current president, uh, Lawrence Springborg, who many would know potentially was the former health minister. Yeah. And it is something that I um, had a very, uh, you know, uh, he was able to share with me. Um, where that could absolutely um, be implemented into health policy uh, as part of, um, you know, through his experience when he was health minister, just never had the time, never got the opportunity, I think, um, to to implement that. So that's, um, that's something that, you know, we definitely, uh, I think, uh, the community will continue to advocate for whether that bill is heard before this um, sitting of parliament uh, is finalised or or post that uh, and and the conversations I've had with the Cata Party are that I'm sure that they will continue to advocate for that as well. Good. Now, we, we talked earlier about the whole matter of, as, as you mentioned, the issues of law and order in Queensland, and uh, we understand that the Cata Party also has, has brought in the or the council law legislation to be debated in the parliament. What, what do you think of the council law legislation, Amanda? So I, unfortunately, because it is a bill before the House and I just checked with my opposition, um, manager of opposition, I can't make any comment on it because it will be debated. So I'm not well, allowed to actually um, uh, commence. Um, yeah, but yeah, and that's on all the bills that are currently before the House, unfortunately. So I, um, I can't probably go into too much detail about that one, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but it's obviously been out in the media. And what, what I could say more generally is uh, there is absolutely a frustration um, that I think I've never, I think many of us across Queensland have never experienced before with the increase in victim of crime numbers. And in particular, that increase, which has seen um, uh, assaults up, uh, break and enters up, car theft uh, of the highest number that we've seen in this state and particularly in the in the part of the world that I reside in far north Queensland and in yep. north Queensland and that um, community uh, are very much frustrated that government policy has failed and there are things that the government certainly did and it was the first laws that they changed in watering down the Youth Justice Act and what we've seen over the course of 10 years is a generation now of hardened criminals um, where uh, and with the introduction of social media and other contributing factors uh, we've seen knife crime increase um, in in home invasion and assaults uh, we're paying the price not just in our own um uh, public safety and our own uh, individual safety, which is which has been compromised, but also in insurance costs. So there's a real translation in how that impact is is occurring to everyday families across uh, and small business owners and etc. across our community. So more broadly, um, you know, any uh, you know, we we've announced our policies and what we will, uh, and there is more to come in that area. So we've certainly announced adult adult crime, adult time, 
um, that that is that is uh, law that we will bring in in the first hundred days of being elected. Um, we have a, a tranche of legislative reform around making Queensland safe, uh, and that is also removing detention as last resort for those repeat youth offenders. So there is um and and gold standard early intervention as well as case management once a young offender is released currently they 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 may only get 72 hours of case management we have made a commitment of 12 months and that will be about accountability boundaries for young people uh, setting them in a path, uh, uh, you know, uh, which is heading in the right direction, and um, and really combating what has been this youth crime crisis that is now impacting so many people across the state. Sure. Okay. So, so Labor's latest plan to alter our anti discrimination legislation refer to people who hold to what they call objectionable opinions in the workplace. How can we define this and is free speech going to be outlawed by this? And, and thirdly, if I can make a third question, is the LNP committed now to repealing this madness? Okay. That's another bill at the moment before the House. We were briefed on that today, uh, not today, earlier this week. So that's currently on the paper. What I can say more broadly is that we believe uh, as the LNP in the freedom of the individual, we very yep. much hold dearly free speech. Good. Um, and uh, and those are the values and the principles that certainly drive us, and that uh, that those values and principles are always reflected in 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 the policy and the and the way in which we will uh, vote. Uh, there are bills obviously before the house where the Labor Party have the majority, yep. and I would anticipate that a number of those bills are going to pass uh, just based upon the government now rushing. Um, you know, we're sitting late now this evening. Through, I'm I'm at par Parliament currently, and we're sitting late over the subsequent days here because of the raft of legislation that the government wants to push through. Um, so I guess for your audience. Um, it's just a, a, a recognition that as a party that um, very much holds uh, the values of our, um, you know, our conservative values, that um, those are things that we will continue to uphold both in opposition and in government. How do you feel about doctors in this whole matter of transgender, Amanda? How do you feel about doctors prescribing puberty blockers for children who are uncertain about their sex? or permitting surgery for them without their parents even knowing about it. Yep. Um, I, uh, I fundamentally um, have issues, significant issues and real concerns uh, about what's occurring in this state and what we're seeing as this, um, uh, you know, it, 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 I think it's exceptionally dangerous. I think um, our children are in such vulnerable um, positions uh, as they as they're growing and they're changing and um, and there uh, in my view there has not been the safeguards in place um, to protect children and and young people and um, I can point certainly to um, a whistleblower here who stood up um, a, a doctor who's been stood down. Um, yeah, and yeah. as part of a review that was undertaken that um, I certainly have uh, no confidence in that um, the review wasn't under that that wasn't independent and and that there is uh, real consequences that we see in other jurisdictions internationally um, where there is real concern at the level of harm that's now um, occurred when it when it comes to young people and uh, their identity and uh, their their sex. And I am uh, and have said it uh, before through legislation that was passed by the Labor government around um, the uh, birth certificates and, yes. and identification there that uh, for me, biology is biology and it's pretty, it's pretty black and white. Um, and um, when it comes to uh, children in particular, uh, being able to make decisions around some of these things without parental consent or without proper um, medical oversight and um, ensuring that there is, um, you know, ethical protocols that that put in safeguards. Uh, I just, th there is some very, very concerning cases out there um, where I think there will be tragic outcomes and some of those, uh, you know, already being reported 
through different media outlets or different lived experience that that um, people have come forward with, but it is very concerning, and I and I believe that um, government, uh, you know, has has an obligation to protect children. Um, these are decisions that young people have been able to make when you can't even make a decision to, you know, you can't get a driver's license or you can't, you know, there's certain things yep. that just in the yep. course of our our modern world um, that there are things you have to adhere to and rules and regulations and they're safeguards. Um, in this area, it has become very, very concerning and uh, I think certainly, um, you know, has put a lot of young people at risk. Yeah, so if parents are, are are really responsible for their children's health, why should their views so commonly be ignored by the health department? Well, and that is something that is even expanding beyond that. That is something I'm hearing from parents across, uh, you know, all parts of our community, whether it's around um, their education, whether it's their health care needs, whether it's about safety, et cetera. Parental rights have been eroded. Over and, and continue to be uh, almost year on year. And the the pleas that I have had from parents all across this state who feel um, that they don't have the rights um, that they should have over their children and to make decisions in the interest of their children, whether that be disciplinary decisions, whether that be around their education um, uh, you know, there there has now been uh, laws that I think have been interpreted, used and made um, that have given uh, children more rights um, that that they are not equipped to have yet. They are, you know, there's, there's we have fundamental human rights, but there are rights um, uh, that parents should have. Um, I mean, it's our job to protect our children and it's our yep. job to make decisions for our children because they're not their brains are not developed enough to do so sure. and we know what the science is around that and uh and um you know i mean i have a 23 year old son he's finally getting there but to make his own decisions well and truly but it, but it does it does on a serious note it is very concerning and it's been uh very concerning to see uh what's come out of um some of uh one of our medical institutions around um some of some of those cases and and I don't think yet we've seen the real uh the real effect and the real impact of, of what's yet to come with with some young people so do you think that we might need to have some kind of inquiry and if 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 you get re-elected of course would you would you be keen to see some kind of inquiry into the whole transgender well Matter? Yes, we, we certainly have supported and I certainly know my deputy leader has called out many times the health minister in the parliament as well and I think publicly we've called upon it that any uh, at the moment the inquiry or the review that was undertaken we ha we have no confidence that it that it was done independently at all and we do feel that that is something that um, is very serious that needs to be addressed and looked at um, you know as a matter of priority. Right. So, so I would definitely support that and be advocating for that for our children. Excellent. Now, I think my colleague, Daryl Budge, has some questions that have come in from viewers, Amanda. So, Daryl, can I just run that back to you? You can pass those questions uh, to Amanda, yeah. please. Thank you, Andrew. And if anybody has any other questions, you can put it down in the Q&A box here on Zoom as well. Um, Amanda, could you highlight any new policies or areas of new policies from the LNP for this coming election? Mm -hmm. um, I can speak to, I guess, across my portfolio. So uh, in my portfolio, we have announced around the children in care. So we have, um, as I mentioned, the numbers have just increased en masse to nearly 2,000 children in residential care. Residential care, for your viewers, is simply a house um, that has been um, a, a, a normal house in a normal suburban area, potentially, that's been retrofitted to be able to house children. Um, my concern there has been about the number of children and if we look at the number of children under the age of 12, um, we've we've exceeded over 600 children now in the state um, with 2,000 in care. You compare that to Victoria of around 75 children. Um, so it, it, Queensland is at a crisis point. And when I hear of cases of five and six-year-old children in care um, that uh, are siblings uh, that are not going to school, 
that are being um, put to bed by one carer, being woken up by another carer, no consistency of care. And this has come from whistleblowers. Um, the concern and the trauma those children are experiencing versus going into a loving family um, and residential care was never designed for that. This government has failed um, in that area. So we have announced that um, we will certainly address, and, and the other part to residential care with older children is we've seen a correlation between that and the youth justice and youth crime crisis. So there's an uh, over 50, 55, nearly 60% of children may be on a dual order of both child safety and youth justice. So a big focus in the child safety system is around um, ensuring that we place those children either into foster care um, or outside of residential care where possible or reunification with kinship or working with families, that those children at the moment who don't uh, are not made to go to school, that they have to go to school, that they are supported through extracurricular activities, that there are consequences for actions um, and they are rewarded for effort. But the state government is the parent of these children and this state government has failed in its duty of care um, for these children. There has been reported illicit drug use. There has been um, all sorts of violence, damage, um, things that have gone on um, in those residential care facilities. And um, that's a key focus area uh, in the child safety policy, but also in the prevention of further youth justice that I will be focused on um, if I'm the minister. Uh, and we've, we've announced our focus and reforms on that. There's certainly a lot more to come um, in the announcement of um, the child portfolio that I have. Um, we see in residential care over 50% of the children have a disability. Um, so I have a very targeted um, response to support those children that will be announced in, in the coming weeks. Um, and similarly, uh, in domestic family violence and um, looking at how uh, we can be responding both to the crisis that, that we have as a community, but how we can be looking at more support for families and early intervention. Um, we know with um, the inf in impact of mental health, alcohol and other drugs, cost of living crisis, when people families are displaced from their either home or they <laughs> have to live multi-generationally, generationally, that's putting enormous pressure on families and family relationships. And what we need to do is ensure that families are supported and that we increase housing supply, that we get the right housing and the right support for those most vulnerable people um, so that we can ensure that there is wraparound support and we don't see the breakdown of the families, um, which has been sadly a significant contributing factor to why we have so many children in the child safety system. So getting and looking at that early intervention with families first to then prevent children going into what is a system um, that's that's causing significant trauma for those young people. Um, but my policy committee, and as a member of the LNP, we have policy committees, um, have been uh, very supportive and very proactive around particularly uh, the permanent placements around foster caring and also the opportunity to transition uh, to adoption, as I mentioned. Uh, and that's an area that um, certainly... Uh, I'm keen to explore um, if we're in government. Very good, very good. The last couple of minutes that we have, um, I just want to highlight that we often say to people to vote for the candidate, vote for the person rather than for the party. I'm just wondering if you could outline some of your fundamental principles of why you as a candidate, that people should vote for you, that you'll be a trustworthy member in Parliament for your local constituents and for, mm -hmm. and for the state of Queensland. Yeah, well, I think it's twofold, and I, I you, you'll tell your members how you should vote. Um, so I, I certainly believe I've demonstrated to my community that I will um, both listen to um, their concerns, advocate on their behalf, and I will do that in a way that is un underpinned by the values. Uh, both of my political party and also my personal values, and I think that that was demonstrated also through um, the Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill, where, in fact, my community um, majority actually supported, uh, a, a bigger majority supported um, that bill. Um, I did not support that bill and I outlined why. I outlined why as a matter of conscience and my own personal values, why I couldn't support that bill, but how I would advocate for the community very openly and transparently um, about the need for uh, equity of access for palliative care and other um, alternatives that lie with both my values 
but also the values of the political party that I am a member of. Um, uh, I will always be open and transparent around around that with my community. So I do think it's important that uh, people do make a decision about the person who they are electing, absolutely, and you do your due diligence. But I am also um, acutely aware that uh, having now been in opposition for for the period I have been in the parliament and how in a unicameral parliament in Queensland, uh, the winning team takes all. And there are very few checks and balances because we do not have an upper house. And so I urge also all Queenslanders at the moment, um, at the time that we see ourselves where we have had uh, a decade of labour, um, that we need uh, a party who is prepared to govern in the interests of all Queenslanders and that has the values um, that are aligned with getting our state back on, on track and focusing on the things that are important to Queenslanders. And I believe that our party is best placed to do that and to change government and to be able to govern. Um, it is it is uh, fundamentally, uh, traditionally, a contest between um, the major parties. So I certainly think you, it's important you do your due diligence around your candidates. Um, it's also very important in Queensland that you do do your diligence around your preferences and wh who you put as your number two vote uh, because um, that's a reality uh, of what, what we're faced um, with here in Queensland. So uh, not all minor parties are alike. And um, some may may say they're directing a preference uh, to a party, but then it goes the other way. And so I certainly encourage people to do their homework and understand the party and the candidates as to their values and, and um, the areas in which um, they see that alignment when they cast their vote. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Amanda. Thank you. I think and I wrapping up. Yes, and I, I apologize I can't stay any longer, but I thank you for the opportunity for your members and um, wish you all. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, so thank much, you so Amanda. much, Amanda, for your time. You, you're a busy lady, I know, and we appreciate your your work in the parliament, and we we trust you have a good outcome from the from the election in ten weeks' time. Here's hoping. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Then. Thank okay, you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.